Previously on Deep Cover. By the late spring of 1985, Ned Timmons was deep into his investigation of the drug smugglers. One of the three major players, the gentleman smuggler, was now behind bars. But Ned was still on a mission to get Mike Vogel, the grocery guy. I had it in such a way that I really control the marijuana industry in Michigan. His other target was Lee Rich, Mr. Beach Club. I'm the boss. Okay, I called the shots. I, if they wanted to load or if I was going to load something, I could secure the boat, plane, whatever. But for now, Ned couldn't do much about the case because in the fall of that year, his cover was blown and there'd been a threat on his life. So the FBI sent Ned and his wife, Kathy, off to northern Michigan to hide. Together, they had to sit quietly and wait it out. This is not any kind of a life that I want to lead. This isn't what any of us signed up for. For Kathy Timmons, going into hiding wasn't just scary. She had her own work, her own career at the FBI that she now had to put on hold. She was tired of Ned's undercover persona, Ed Thomas, messing everything up. Oh, I was very angry. I was very upset. Um, I was scared. You know, and then I just had to let it be, let it go, just be up there and sit and wait. To make matters worse, she didn't feel well. I thought I was sick or something or maybe just really, really tired because I just kept falling asleep and then I started feeling the queasiness and everything. And I thought, "Uh uh-oh, maybe I got pregnant. After being in hiding for about three weeks, the FBI calls and tells Ned and Kathy the coast is clear. They'd caught the bikers who had planned to kill Ned. So Ned and Kathy come out of hiding. They go home. Kathy, who's still not feeling well, visits the doctor and learns she is pregnant. In a way, the timing wasn't ideal. Their lives had just been turned upside down. And yet, Kathy took this as a sign. Like God meant it to be. Because we had been married for how many years by then? And I had never gotten pregnant. And I never did anything not to get pregnant, so I just thought, oh, okay, you know, I'm Catholic, you know. I was like, okay, this is meant to be. Now, all she had to do was tell Ned. I thought that he would be thrilled um, and that this would really help to bring a closure to all of this craziness with this undercover work. I asked Ned, what were your thoughts about having kids given the nature of your work? It wasn't time. Did you think you ever wanted to have kids? You know, I really didn't give it much thought. I, uh, you know, I was just consumed by work and what we were doing. So when you get back from this trip to northern Michigan and she's like, I'm pregnant, what is your reaction? Well, yeah, it's just, well, I guess we're going to roll with it, you know? I'm Jake Halpern, and this is Deep Cover. Episode 7, The Honeymoon is Over. After he comes out of hiding, Ned is back working on his case against Lee Rich, Mr. Beach Club. But for the time being, there was no easy way for Ned or the FBI to apprehend Lee. Extraditions from the Caymans were rare. Plus, Ned says, down in the Caymans, Lee was kind of a Robin Hood figure, a beloved outlaw. Lee was the Robin Hood who had taken care of all the bankers and all the people on the island and buried friends and, and relatives and paid for everybody's expenses. He had a big heart, and he, and he took care of a lot of people. And it would have been probably impossible to get him extradited out of there. So, on the one hand, Ned was frustrated that he couldn't apprehend Lee. But he also knew that Lee was kind of trapped. And he knew this because of a conversation that they'd had when they were in the Caymans together. We had always talked alone a lot. 
and I just turned to him one day. We were probably having a drink or something. I said, Lee, why don't you get the hell out of this? Just quit. And Lee said, I can't. They'll kill me. And I, I believe he meant the Colombians would kill him. Lee was on the hook for a million pounds of marijuana that he'd ordered from the Colombians. And that, by the way, is a shitload of marijuana. Look, this isn't an exact science, but I talked to a smuggler who once saw this much weed down in Colombia, and he described it as a, quote, fucking mountain, end quote. He actually built a small fort up on top of it and slept there. So you get the idea. Lee was under pressure to move that much marijuana. And remember, Lee's go-to guy, Stephen Kalish, the gentleman smuggler, he was in custody at this point. So Lee pushed ahead without his star smuggler, tried to move at least some of it. He arranged for a tugboat to tow a barge with 165,000 pounds of pot on it up to Virginia. The boat was intercepted by the US Coast Guard and the cargo was confiscated. It was a total disaster. It was all scrapped. It was done, you know. At this point, Lee is finally feeling ready to just get out of the business. You know, I was just, I was tired of it. I didn't need it. And I blame a lot of that on myself for not being strong enough to tell people, I don't want to do this. I'm done. It was a moment of reckoning for Lee. Remember, from the very start, Lee says he'd gotten into the marijuana business so he could Chill with his buddies. Nonviolent, beach guys, you know, lived on the beach to surf and fish and, and never hurt anybody, okay? Even as his business grew and he became really wealthy, this was still his credo. He had the yacht, which the queen borrowed, and the beach club with the funny parrot and the cool house that rock stars came to visit. It had been fun for a long time, until suddenly, well, it really wasn't anymore. And then, as if this weren't already perfectly clear, Alvin Connor came knocking. I know Lee Rich for years. Alvin was the chief inspector of narcotics for the Cayman Island Police Force back in the 80s. We used to search all his private plea, and you come in every week, Two, two, three times a week with all these girls, pretty girls he used to bring. Alvin says he had suspected for a while that Lee might be involved in the drug trade. Nothing solid, just chatter, which isn't surprising. This was a small island. Inevitably, people talked. Alvin says he searched Lee's private plane a number of times, but never found any drugs. But then, one day, in January of 1986, about six months after Ned had left the island, Alvin says he got a tip which led him to believe that Lee might have some drugs at his house. This was all that Alvin needed, just a lead, a whiff of something. Because on the island, Alvin had a reputation for chasing a scent. Every time you see me come in, they say, the dog is here, you call me the dog. Wait, why do they call you the dog? Marijuana. I smell it. They say that I can smell it. If a day I can find it. They call me the dog. They say the dog come now. And the dog? He was coming for Lee. He didn't know about Ned Timmons or the FBI investigation. He just wanted to bust Lee Rich. So he heads over to Lee's house. I said, we're here to look for drugs. Alvin says he searches the room and finds about an ounce of cocaine. He arrests Lee on the spot for drug possession. Lee says the whole thing was a setup. They planted a, uh, two or three grams of coke in my house and came in and raided the house. My mother's in the house, and I think I had about eight people staying in the house at that time. So it was a big scene when they took Lee away in handcuffs. The whole thing was upsetting for Lee, in part because his mom was there. She started making a fuss, and Alvin confronted her. I said, if you, if you, if you don't shut your mouth, I'm going to arrest you and charge for obstructing police officer. I said, I'm going to arrest you and charge you, and I'll charge you for this cocaine, too. The message to Lee seemed to be clear. 
I'm not afraid of you. I'll mess with your mom if need be. Alvin took Lee down to the police station, booked him, locked him up. But soon, Lee got out on bail, around $5,000. That's the amount that Alvin recalls anyway, which was nothing to Lee. Yeah, he was like a king. Big shot, like a big shot, and nobody could touch him. He tells Lee, If the judge won't let you go that he business, but I'm going to do my job. For Lee, the biggest fallout from all of this was that he had to give up his passport. The police claimed that he was a flight risk, so they insisted that he leave his passport with them at the station. So he'd have to go and ask for it back if he ever wanted to leave the island. Lee was beginning to feel trapped. Around this same time, he was hanging out at a local bar on Grand Cayman when he bumps into a guy he knows who works for Scotland Yard. Lee buys him a drink. And he goes, Rich, he goes, I'm just, I'm going to tell you something. He goes, don't take your boat out past 12 miles. Don't go out on the bank fishing. Don't leave the island. They're trying to get you on a Coast Guard cutter or something off a of Cayman. He said, and I'm just telling you that because you're a decent guy. It seemed like the walls were really closing in on Lee now. His business partner, the gentleman smuggler, was in jail and quite possibly talking to U.S. authorities. The dog was pursuing him on the island, and now the Scotland Yard guy was telling him, don't take your boat too far offshore. So I knew then, from what he told me that night, uh, they're really onto my ass, okay? And I started making arrangements. I was going to leave, and I was going to Europe. To Portugal, actually. Lee's grandfather was Portuguese, and he figured if he could get there, he might use that familial connection to get his status as a resident. He thought he'd be safe there. So, in May of 1986, a full year after Ned first visited Lee in the Caymans, Lee got ready to make his escape. And then, as chance would have it, Lee got a visit from a friend, which derailed everything. And that friend was Tommy Lee Bass. You know, from Motley Crue. Lee Rich was about to flee the Cayman Islands. But he had a scheduling conflict. A buddy was coming to town. Tommy Lee Bass founding member of the band Motley Crue. In the mid-1980s, Tommy Lee and his bandmate, Nikki Six, were the bad boys of the heavy metal world. I remember you people from last time. You motherfuckers like to party. Is that true? Well, if you're a pervert, say, fuck yeah! I fucking knew it. I just fucking knew it. Tommy Lee and his bandmates had come to visit the Caymans a few times before. Turns out the band's manager, Doc McGee, was one of Lee's investors. They all got along famously. Tommy even wrote about the first time that he'd met Lee in Motley Crue's memoir, The Dirt. Here's a clip from the audiobook, and just a heads up, for some reason, the narrator calls Lee, Lay. Anyway. Lay walked into Doc's rental house with an attache case. The first words we spoke to him were, gimme, gimme, gimme because we knew what was in that fucking attache case. Mountains of white powder to stuff up our noses. Lay opened the case and gave us a little rock. In the memoir, Lee then shuts his briefcase, locks it, winks, and tells them if they can open the combination lock, Tommy could have the rest of it. We were so coked out that we actually thought we were coming up with every single permutation of three numbers. Finally, I went into the kitchen, grabbed a butcher knife, and cut the top of Lay's $1,000 leather briefcase. Glittering inside like white gold were fucking dozens of huge plastic bags filled with coke. So there you have it. An epic drug dealer, an epic rock star who loved drugs. It was a friendship made in heaven. Tommy wasn't traveling to the Caymans alone. He was coming with the latest love of his life the actress, Heather Locklear. She'd starred in a few hit TV shows like Dynasty and TJ Hooker, where she played a rookie cop who once even goes undercover herself as a call girl. 
Hey, uh, Hooker, where is she supposed to wear her wire? In my trick bag. An out-call girl never parts with her trick bag. You don't get any ideas about helping me on with it. It's fine just where it is. Heather and Tommy, they'd met backstage in an REO Speedwagon concert. Their relationship would become fodder for E! Hollywood. The bad boy of rock had found his princess. Tommy was now living the life. He had fame, fortune, and love. The happy couple left for a three-week honeymoon in the Cayman Islands. Upon their return... Tommy was coming to visit to spend his honeymoon on the Cayman Islands, seeing his good buddy Lee, the guy with the magic suitcase. Lee still remembers just how excited Tommy was. He was head over heels on this girl. He said, I really want to come back here and spend my honeymoon. I said, don't worry, I'll take care of you, you know? Lee could have told him no. The timing's bad, man. My drug empire is falling apart. I may soon be imprisoned. But that was just not Mr. Beach Club's style. His buddy was coming to town. So his escape plan to Portugal would just have to wait. Lee arranged for a nice condo on the beach for Tommy and Heather. And, uh... I got a call the next day after leaving him there that night from the manager of the condo, asked me to remove him from the property, both of them, because they were up all night running up and down in the parking lot, high on whatever. Not a huge surprise. From the Motley Crue memoir, you get a sense for how Tommy partied. Gimme, gimme, gimme. So Lee, he moves the couple to another condo. But the situation doesn't get any better. It was one big headache for Lee. So they decide, let's go to Jamaica. It'll be better over there. Lee books them some villas, makes all the arrangements, and he decides that this trip to Jamaica will be the perfect excuse to run for it. So he goes to the Cayman police and somehow or another manages to get his passport back. Lee says he's just flying with some friends to Jamaica for a mini vacation. But his real plan is to keep going to London and then on to Portugal. So he packs a briefcase with some pocket money, 30,000 in cash, and boards a plane with Tommy and Heather from Montego Bay, Jamaica. That night when we flew to Mo Bay, when I come off the airplane, one of the girls from the counter, she called me by my name. She goes, Lee. I looked at her and she goes, there's two agents waiting on you inside the customs area there. Two agents. And like that, Lee understood. Had to be the feds. Somehow, they'd been tipped off. What Lee didn't know at the time was that the FBI had a source who knew about his trip and ratted him out. And now, here he was, on the ground at the Montego Bay Airport, walking right into a trap. Here's Tommy, he's got one of these boom boxes, okay, up on his shoulder. And he's jagging that around, hollering, he's dragging this Heather with him, okay? Going ahead of me. And so I, I went behind him, went into customs, and sure enough, those agents came up to me. Tommy made us, started confronting them too, you know, hey, what, there's no, he hadn't done anything, you know? And so they threatened to arrest him. And that was the end of that. Tommy and Heather went one way, and the two FBI agents escorted Lee out of the airport and into a car where a Jamaican police officer was waiting for them. They then all head to the hotel where the FBI agents were staying so they could grab their stuff. We go to the hotel and uh, the two agents get out of the car. We're sitting in the parking lot. I'm in there with this cop. And the cop that was in the front seat driving us he was one of the cops I used to pay off. And I said, listen, you, don't, you remember who I am? You know who I am? So he goes, I can't help you, Rich. I said, I'll never forget it. <laughs> so you know, I was kind of threatening him. And I said, all you got to do is let me run. He goes, I can't do it. So he wouldn't let me out. And that was it. The two FBI agents got back in the car. They drove to Kingston and caught the next flight back to the U.S. with Lee in custody. In Motley Crue's memoir, Tommy Lee Bass takes full responsibility for all of this, saying that he and Heather caused the downfall of one of the country's biggest drug smugglers, all because they didn't want to go to Jamaica alone. Tommy writes, Heather and I felt terrible. We had no one to show us around Jamaica.
Now that he was in federal custody, Lee Rich began to mull over where exactly he'd gone wrong. And he recalled something that his business partner, Mike Vogel, the grocery guy, had told him. Mike was the distributor who ran the enormous drug warehouse back in Detroit. And Lee says, Mike, he had never really liked Tommy and Heather, thought they were trouble. Lee remembers him saying repeatedly, stay away from those people. They're going to be your downfall. Mike Vogel was right. In fact, more right than he knew. In a way, Tommy and Heather would also be his downfall. Because at the very moment that Lee was being apprehended in Jamaica, there was another operation targeting Mike Vogel back in Detroit. When we come back after the break, Ned Timmons and the FBI make their move on the grocery guy. Back in Michigan, Ned was itching to arrest Mike Vogel. The idea was to get both of these guys, Lee and then Mike, almost at the exact same time, so neither one of them would tip off the other. Everything had to be perfectly synchronized. This moment, it was the culmination of almost three years of work on Ned's part. It had been an epic journey, taking him from a roadside biker bar in Detroit all the way to the glitzy beaches of the Caymans. And during this time, Ned's case had steadily grown, merging with other investigations in North Carolina, Louisiana, and Florida. Other agencies had gotten involved too, like the DEA, the IRS, the Coast Guard, US Customs, and a slew of state and county investigators. Together, the authorities had built a strong case against the smugglers. And throughout this time, Ned had kept pretty close tabs on Mike Vogel. And apparently, Mike had picked up on this. That's what he told me anyway. Mike boasted to me that he had sources within the FBI. He added, rather cryptically, that he knew all about Ned. Did I sit down, have lunch or dinner with him? No. Okay. I just, I was aware of him. I was very aware of him. I remember the day that Ned Timmons ever got involved with me. I wish I had never heard my name. So on May 23rd, 1986, the same day Lee gets arrested, Ned Timmons is staked out at Mike Vogel's house in Milford. We had the whole SWAT team out there laying in Vogel's place all night long, waiting for word that they had Lee in custody. And once we got word that they had Lee in custody, then we had Vogel's house. As Ned and his FBI team are getting ready, something really weird happens. According to Ned, a Black Panther starts stalking the woods. A Black Panther in Michigan, okay? So there was some sightings of it. And we're in the SWAT team, moonlight night. We've been laying out there all night, night vision and everything. And this panther had been released. People had seen it and reported, you know, that there's a black panther running around out here and some cattle had been killed. And so we're all laying out there, talking on our radios, and, you know, waiting for word to hit the house. And this panther was screaming like this, in the night, in the moonlight. And, you know, you know it's out there someplace and you're laying in the grass. And it was a bit nerve wracking. Okay, so I was skeptical about this story. Seemed like another Ned tale that would be, well, impossible to fact check. And then I found an article from the time dispatched from the town where Mike Vogel lived, confirming that, yes, there had been over 30 sightings of this large predatory cat. Anyway, Ned was focused on getting the job done. Meanwhile, Mike is in his house, asleep next to his wife, Julie. I had driveway sensors, you know, put, you know if anybody's coming on your property, okay? And I always, beep, 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 beep. Julie looked at me and I said, what's that? I said, it's the feds. I could tell, you know. You don't have 20 beeps going off for one car. It was a whole group of them that came. They had IRS guys, they had uh, FBI guys, and a few DEA guys, and Michigan State Police. And of course, Ned Timmons was there too. 
And in this moment when Ned Timmons, G-Man, shows up to arrest Mike Vogel, master criminal, it isn't some kind of tense standoff. They don't stare each other down or cuss each other out. Mike says that Ned he was pretty friendly, cordial. That was the word he used. Like two boxers after a fight, all the swagger gone. And now, just the handshake. He allowed me to go ahead and take a shower and say goodbye to my wife and kids, and we're going to prison. Mike Vogel was indicted in federal court in Detroit. The indictment alleged that he and his fellow smugglers were responsible for importing at least 566,000 pounds of marijuana. Investigators estimated that, over the years, they'd smuggled as much as $1 billion worth of drugs into the U.S. Vogel pled guilty that same year. He was stripped of his wealth, forfeiting, among other things, a boat, five cars, and four homes in Michigan. He was sentenced to 25 years in prison. Lee was arrested and Vogel was arrested, and, and it became, it was all in the paper, you know, the whole, the whole outlay of everything. And The story made big headlines, actually, and for a moment, Ned was kind of famous. An article in the Detroit Free Press chronicled Ned's adventures. An anonymous source told the paper that Ned, quote, made the case, end quote. The source went on to say, I've seen a lot of undercover agents, but this guy, special. He's got ice in his veins. And he's a tough cookie, one of the new breed. He's a high caliber agent who has that unique ability to be able to understand and work with the people he's been sent undercover to investigate. For Ned, it was vindication. He had spent the better part of three years playing the role of his alter ego. In a way, he built Ed Thomas from the ground up. His backstory, his demeanor, his friendships, his hard drinking, hardly riding lifestyle. And Ed Thomas had served his purpose. It was as if all the risks that Ned had taken, all the close calls, all the paranoia, all the boundaries he'd pushed, somehow or another, it had all worked out. So maybe it was finally time to be done with undercover work. After all, Ned had a big win under his belt. Plus, at almost the exact same time of these events in May of 1986, there was other big news. Ned's son was born. And Ned, the action-craving, sometimes reckless, Harley-riding, undercover guy, he loved his son. Kathy says that the baby was attached to him at the hip. Oh, yeah. No, they were like freaking frack. I mean, as soon as he came in, uh, the door, he'd pick him up. I don't think he would put him down. Just about every picture I have, um, he had this shark that he caught um, while we were on our honeymoon um, down in the Keys. And here's this hammerhead shark, and he, he has it installed in the den of our home. And uh, so he'd put the baby up there, up on top of the shark, like as if he's riding the shark, and take a picture, you know. I mean, he just couldn't get enough of um, our oldest son. You know, even if his parents would volunteer to, you know, oh, leave the baby here and we'll take care of him. No, no, he's going with us. Wow. Yeah. Did that make you feel hopeful about? Yes, I felt, and and so yes, I felt very, very hopeful and good, good about things, and um, I felt that, you know, whatever work he was going to wrap up then on that, and then that would be the end of, end of that case and he'd move on to the next set of cases. I'm like, oh, thank God. Back to normal life. But it did never go back to normal life. As it turns out, Ned's case, it wasn't over. Not really. Mr. Beach Club and the gentleman smuggler would have their day in court. So there'd be a trial. But that wasn't all. Far to the south, down in Central America, the silent partner, the general, Manuel Noriega, he was still at large, operating with impunity. But that was about to change. Word was getting out about what the general had been up to. And in Washington, D.C., a political shitstorm was brewing. Next 
next time on Deep Cover. I just knew that the information that I could divulge about Noriega and his activities were a bombshell. There's no doubt in my mind that there's ramifications that go all the way to the top. I mean, literally from Reagan on down. Deep Cover is produced by Jacob Smith and edited by Karen Chikurji. Our story editor is Jack Hitt. Original music and our theme was composed by Luis Guerra, and Flawn Williams is our engineer. Fact-checking by Amy Gaines. Mia Lobel is Pushkin's executive producer. Ned's novel is read by Walton Goggins. Special thanks to Julia Barton, Heather Fain, Carly Migliori, Lital Malad, Maya Koenig, Eric Sandler, Maggie Taylor, Khadija Holland, Zoe Gwen, and Jacob Weisberg at Pushkin Industries. Special thanks also to Jeff Singer at Stowaway Entertainment. I'm Jake Halpern.